Roger Olson was born and raised in a pastor's home in Iowa South and South Dakota. He married Becky. She's right here next to him. And they have two daughters. No grandchildren yet. I was asking him about that. He did his M.A. in Religious Studies at North American Baptist Seminary in Sioux Falls, South Dakota, and a Ph.D. in Religious Studies at Rice University in 1984. In 1984 to 1999, he taught at Bethel College and Seminary in St. Paul, Minnesota, and he has since 99 been teaching at Baylor University, which is in Waco, Texas. And I asked him about that, and he said, well, because I know Waco is a hot place in the summer, he'd rather have a Waco summer than a St. Paul winter. So that <laughs> gives you an idea. Anyway, he's currently professor of theology at George Truett Seminary, which is part of the Baylor University complex. He has served as an editor of Christian Scholars Review and as a consulting editor with Christianity Today. These are well-known publications. He has co-authored books with Stan Grintz, late of Regent College, and he's published several books in his own right. Some of them are on the table out there, and I would encourage you, I know some of you have already looked at them, in fact, some have already been purchased, but we've made them available to you either at cost or with a slight discount. So that's just a service for you, and it's an opportunity to pick up a book or two by our distinguished lecturer, and since he's here, you can get him to autograph it for you. Roger's very active in professional societies. He attends conferences, reads papers, he loves to travel, and uh, loves going on hikes, and loves reading historical novels. So he and I have a lot in common. Tonight, his lecture, his series, is on reformed and always reforming the post-conservative mood in evangelical theology. That really intrigued me when he submitted that, uh, some months ago, submitted that to us, as his lecture topic. It comes to us in three forms, tonight, Tuesday night, and Wednesday night, all at 7.30. Tonight, it's post-conservative theology is pilgrim theology. I'm intrigued by that title, and I look forward to hearing what Dr. Olson has to say. Let's welcome him. I'm honored that you would come out on this chilly, rainy Nova Scotia evening to hear me speak. Thank you very much for being here. We just arrived in Nova Scotia for the first time the other day, flew into Halifax from Texas. It's been almost in the 90s there until a week or two ago when it finally cooled down a little bit. But you could send some of this rain down to us. We've been in a, in a bad drought for months. I don't think we've had any significant rain for about three months or so. In that kind of heat, then everything kind of dries up. If you ask my wife what has excited me the most since I got into Nova Scotia, she might tell you it's all the Baptist churches I've seen. Now you have to understand, I've lived in Texas for the last six years, and there are lots of Baptist churches there, so I'm used to seeing Baptist churches. In fact, in the Waco Baptist Association, and Waco is a city about the size of Halifax, we have 112 Baptist churches in the Waco Baptist Association. Now, I'll let you try to figure out for yourselves how that many churches came to exist in Waco, Texas, but you might conclude on your own when I tell you that so many united Baptist churches impresses me. You see, where I come from, where I come from, that's an oxymoron. Now, you may have already heard this one, but I can't resist telling you, since I've seen so many united Baptist churches, there was a man who was a Baptist, but not a united Baptist, who was stranded on a desert island somewhere in the South Pacific. And after several years, his rescuers finally found him. And as they came on shore, he stood there greeting them like Tom Hanks in Castaway, all shaggy and disheveled looking. And they saw three buildings behind him. 
and he had obviously built them with his own hands. And his rescuer said, what are those three buildings back there behind the shore? And he said, well, that one's my house. And they said, what are the other two? And he said, well, that one's my church. That's where I worship. And they said, okay, what's the third one? He said, well, that's where I used to worship. <laughs> that's, that one's getting a little long in tooth now. Many of you have already heard it, but I can't resist telling it, having seen all these wonderful United Baptist churches. I'm going to take that message back to Texas with me, that Baptists can be united. This lecture came to be because I was thinking about writing a book. And as I was formulating the book idea in my mind, the call came to give the Hayward Lectures. And so when they asked me for a title for the series that I'm going to give these next three evenings, uh, the title of the book came to my mind. A lot of times I start a book project with a title, and then the book evolves from the title. I'm not sure if that's the way it's supposed to be, because sometimes the publishers don't like your title, and your book comes out, and it's a different title than you thought it was going to be. Just the other day, I received the wonderful news from my publisher, InterVarsity Press, that my suggested title for my next book is the title it will have. And I breathed a huge sigh of relief. And the title, by the way, I'll put a little plug in for it, it'll come out next year, is Arminian Theology, Myths and Realities. Arminian Theology, Myths and Realities. I'll let you buy it, read it, and find out what the myths are and what I think the realities are. But there's no book that I know of in print right now on Arminian theology. There are lots on Calvinist theology, but not any that I know of on Arminianism. So that's what I've written, and it's uh, at the publishers now. But I wanted to write a book next with the title Reformed and Always Reforming, which you may know, of course, is one of the mottos of the Reformation. And in the Reformation of the 16th century, Luther and Calvin and other reformers talked about the church undergoing continual reform. And um, that's, I like that motto. In addition to sola scriptura, uh, sola fides, priesthood of the believer, and the fourth one is reformed and always reforming. But then I subtitle the book, The Post-Conservative Mood in Evangelical Theology. Now when you come someplace to speak and it's a different context, you don't know if you're going to really connect or not because context is all important. And I'm sure you already know this, but down in the States, we've been having a struggle for a while over the word evangelical. What does that mean? I have a lot of friends who I think are evangelicals because they're God-fearing, Bible-believing, Jesus-loving Christians, but they don't call themselves evangelical anymore because they can't identify with the book covers and titles that they see as being called evangelical. The other, just on the way here in an airport in Dallas, I saw the three most important theologians of today in America, their books displayed together, and they were all television preachers. And of course you see them on television, I do anyway, I think you may hear. And uh, this is what evangelical has come to mean to a lot of people, and also associations with the religious right and so on and so forth. But even within evangelical academic circles, we've been having some hard conversations about what evangelical means and what's necessary to being an evangelical. So tonight and in the next two evenings, I want to unfold for you a little bit about my vision of evangelicalism. And tonight I'm going to talk about evangelical theology as a pilgrim theology. So the title of my lecture series is Reformed and Always Reforming, the Post-Conservative Mood in Evangelical Theology. I hope you'll bear with me as I unpack the title and explain what I mean by post-conservative evangelical theology. Eventually I will develop the specific theme of this first lecture, which is pilgrim theology. Lecture two, tomorrow evening, will be devoted to post-conservative ways of knowing God, that is theological epistemology, and lecture three will focus on post-conservative moves in contemporary evangelical thinking about God's being or theology proper. The juxtaposition of post-conservative and evangelical comes as something of a shock to many evangelicals and perhaps other Christians. I first identified a new mood in evangelical theology and labeled it that way as post-conservative 
in a 1995 Christian Century article entitled Post-Conservative Evangelicals Greet the Postmodern Age. I thought I had coined the term post-conservative evangelical, but later I discovered that Fuller Theological Seminary theology professor Jack Rogers had intended his 1974 Westminster Press book Confessions of a Conservative Evangelical to be titled Confessions of a Post-Conservative Evangelical which would have been a better fit for the contents of his little book. I've never discovered why the title was changed before it was published. I just talked to him on the phone the other day and asked him and he doesn't remember. I remember reading that little theological autobiography of Jack Rogers and wondering why it had that title. Because it was the story of a theological pilgrimage from conservatism to something else that he never really named. In his book, Professor Rogers well described the trouble with the common identification of evangelicalism with conservatism. I suspect this is why reactions to my 1975 or 1995 Christian Century article have been negative. Many evangelicals have the deeply ingrained habit of thinking that evangelicalism and evangelical theology are necessarily conservative. And they mistakenly assume that post-conservative means anti-conservative, or not at all conservative. But I challenged those assumptions in 1995, and in a later article in Christianity Today entitled, Does Evangelical Theology Have a Future?, which was published in 1998. There I was asked by the editors of Christianity Today to avoid the term post-conservative, so I used the synonym reformist to name the new mood in evangelical theology. In Confessions of a Conservative Evangelical, Professor Jack Rogers very incisively described the problem with the adjective conservative when attached to evangelical theology. There he wrote as a good pilgrim theologian, I am changing. Changing is not the same as arriving at a new place. Words are often signposts marking a journey. Conservative is a good word. It marks continuity with the past preservation of enduring values, holding on to what has been proven with time. And in this sense, I am still a conservative. I want to hold fast what is good. There is another sense in which the word conservative is used. The dictionary defines conservative as tending to favor the preservation of the existing order and to regard proposals for change with distrust. Being conservative in that sense leads to conservatism, that is the sense of being conservative which has marked much of my past, Jack Rogers wrote. That is the sense of being conservative which I want to put behind me. That is the sense of being conservative which confuses Christianity with our culture. Salvation is not found in the status quo. From apostolic times, Christians have challenged the existing order. End of quote. I identified with Professor Rogers' pilgrimage and his discomfort with the label conservative when I first read the book during my second year of seminary in 1976, and I still identify with that. Conservative is good so long as it does not signify complacent satisfaction with the status quo or reactionary defensiveness of past achievements to the exclusion of the word of God made fresh for new times. Reactions to the label post-conservative evangelical have been many and varied. Some evangelicals and others have adopted it as a way of naming a new mood of openness to change and diversity within an evangelical framework of life and thought. Non-evangelical theologian Gary Dorian picked up the term in his 1998 Westminster book, The Remaking of Evangelical Theology, and his use of it fit my intentions almost perfectly. On the other hand, conservative evangelical theologian Millard Erickson misused it in his 1997 Baker volume, The Evangelical Left, encountering post-conservative evangelical theology. There he equated post-conservative with left-wing evangelical and described the mood as if it were a pernicious movement among evangelicals. He did not seem to notice that one of the most important features of the post-conservative mood is a profound dissatisfaction with the deeply ingrained evangelical habit of locating every theologian and every theolo theological project on the left-right spectrum, which is largely based on reactions to modernity. It was never my intention for post-conservatism to be left-wing. 
Post-conservatives regard the evangelical theological captivity to modernity and liberal theology, even if as their enemy, as passé. It is time to move on after the fashion of the post-liberal Yale theologians and leave behind forever the too limiting use of modernity to categorize and pigeonhole every theological development. Some conservative evangelicals have reacted very negatively to the post-conservative mood in evangelical theology. One warned readers that it would lead to theological anarchy and darkly hinted that post-conservatives are open to radical revisionism even in sexual ethics. He stated without any warrant that post-conservatives are open to gay marriages and other perversions. Others have called for us to drop the prefix post and return to the rich label conservative to describe our evangelical faith. This suggestion was by the president of a well-known progressive evangelical seminary. In sum, controversy has surrounded the term since I coined it or brought it to public attention and use in 1995. Only a few evangelical scholars, including John Frankie and Kevin Van Hooser, have dared publicly to use it to describe themselves and their projects. Evangelical administrators and publishers are frightened of the label. It seems too daring and risky to them. I still think it is a useful, if somewhat ambiguous, category and concept. To me, it helpfully describes a growing evangelical dissatisfaction with many deeply ingrained habits of the evangelical mind, which I regard as typified in the actions of some leaders of the Evangelical Theological Society as well as in the works of influential evangelical theologians who seem too often overly concerned with reacting to liberal theology and criticizing perceived theological error among fellow evangelicals. Some of the leading voices in contemporary conservative evangelical theology include David Wells, Donald Carson, Millard Erickson, Wayne Grudem, Norman Geisler, and Albert Moeller. No one of them embodies all that I associate with conservative evangelicalism any more than any single post-conservative evangelical embodies every common feature of that mood. Rather, the conservative approach finds representation in those scholars that I just named in varying degrees in different ways, just as the post-conservative mood finds expression in scholars like Clark Pinnock, John Sanders, Greg Boyd, John Frankie, Nancy Murphy, Brian Walsh, Hal Knight, Kevin Van Hooser, and Brian McLaren in varying degrees and ways. I insist that post-conservative evangelicalism be understood in a certain way. It is not a plastic nose that can be twisted to fit any knave's face. First of all, post-conservative modifies evangelical. It does not undermine or reject it. Post-conservative is not post-evangelical, a separate but sometimes overlapping mood described by British writer David Tomlinson in his 2003 Zondervan book, The Post-Evangelical. Post-conservative evangelicals are determined to be evangelicals and not allow anyone to push them out of the evangelical movement. They are not in the least interested in abandoning their evangelical roots and commitments. Their only dissatisfaction is with the cultural captivity of evangelicalism that holds it prisoner to its fundamentalist roots. Evangelicalism emerged out of fundamentalism in the 1940s and 1950s, but the post-fundamentalist evangelical establishment stayed too close to fundamentalism and eventually embraced a new form of fundamentalism, which now goes under the label conservative evangelicalism. Post-conservatives are interested in remaining evangelical while moving further along the trajectory away from fundamentalism and toward a truly biblical and contemporary faith charted by their evangelical forebears. So I need to define evangelicalism. I've been using the term a lot and it is a con essentially contested concept, so I need to tell you what I think it means. If post-conservative evangelicals are first and fo foremost evangelicals, what does that mean? Unfortunately, both journalists and leading self-appointed spokesmen for evangelicalism often agree that the movement is a relatively monolithic lobby for theologically and politically conservative causes. I argue that true evangelicalism is a large tent under which a diverse group of mostly Protestant Christians find fellowship and common cause. It is a loose coalition of God-fearing, 
Bible-believing, Jesus-loving people who are equally committed to the authority of the Bible, Jesus Christ as God's Savior and Lord, a supernatural life and worldview, conversion by the power of the Holy Spirit for justification and regeneration, a vision of the cross and resurrection of Jesus Christ as the hope for spiritual fulfillment, and activism in the cause of world transformation through evangelism and social action. If that's conservative, so be it. Post-conservatives are then conservatives. In any room full of uh, people who represent the full spectrum of Christian theological options, post-conservative evangelicals will stand with the conservatives over against all who preach a different gospel. But among evangelicals, they are dissatisfied with what commonly goes under that banner, and especially with maximal conservatism, the habit of endorsing and enforcing the most conservative options and answers in any theological controversy. Post-conservative evangelicals are not then post-evangelicals. They are evangelicals who find refreshing breezes of biblical insights in the writings of N.T. Wright, stimulating suggestions for revisioning God in the works of Jürgen Moltmann, helpful pointers for renewing evangelical epistemology in the project of Stanley Grenz, and exciting new light for theological reconstruction in the mind of Clark Pinnock. That is not to say they are all equally enamored with any one of these people. Post-conservative evangelicals are not homogenous among themselves. But to a very large extent, these and other progressive biblical thinkers rooted in the evangelical faith are heroes and not heretics to post-conservatives. They have opened new doors to deeper understanding and forged new paths of discovery in hermeneutics and theology. Post-conservatives are eager to listen and learn critically but appreciatively from these and other voices. For post-conservatives, theology is a choir, not a cacophony of relativism, or a unison background humming to a single voice. It is a pilgrimage together of diverse travelers toward the kingdom and not a fortress whose walls and gates are guarded by a few centuries devoted to a single monarch of thought. If all this sounds more like a mood than a movement, that's all to the good. When I talk about post-conservative evangelicals, I'm not referring to a monolithic group, let alone to an organization. Rather, I'm talking about evangelicals of many different stripes who share a common dissatisfaction with the status quo and a somewhat common vision of a way forward. So what are the hallmarks of the post-conservative mood in evangelical theology? And to a large extent, my lecture tonight is general about post-conservatism in general, and then tomorrow night and the third night I'll get more specific. These are not universal characteristics. They are not required features, but family resemblances. A single individual might display several, but not all of them, and still be post-conservative. The first hallmark, and I cannot emphasize this enough, is commitment to the gospel of Jesus Christ. What is the gospel? That is itself somewhat contested among evangelicals. The June 14, 1999 issue of Christianity Today published a symposium entitled The Gospel of Jesus Christ, an Evangelical Celebration written by a committee of conservative evangelicals and signed by scores of evangelical leaders and scholars. It contained a very positive and simple, straightforward statement of the gospel, but then continued with a list of denials in the old fashion of canons and decrees, heavily marked by reformed scholastic language and categories. Many post-conservative evangelicals could not sign this statement because of the content of its anathemas which seem to rule out inclusivism of salvation and require belief in justification as a purely forensic act of God. It identified belief in the atonement of Jesus Christ with the penal substitution theory and rested heavily on monergistic foundations in which God is the all-determining reality. Some Anabaptists and Arminians signed it, but many evangelicals of those traditions could not sign it and felt marginalized, if not excluded, by it. I prefer to think of the gospel as something simpler and more elegant. It is the good news that God has come in Jesus Christ to save the world by his life, death, and resurrection, and that by God's grace through faith in him, people can be rescued from condemnation and corruption and brought by God into a new form of life marked by blessedness, hope, and eventually bliss of heaven. 
The conservative impulse is to criticize any such brief statement of the gospel as inadequate and inflate it by importing into it a system of theology such as the one that continues to reign supreme in the background of most conservative evangelical thought, Charles Hodges, 1872, three-volume Systematic Theology. Post-conservatives insist that the gospel is free from captivity to any system of theology, which is always nothing more than human reflection on the gospel. But post-conservatives are no less committed to the gospel than are the devotees of Hodges' theology. A second hallmark of post-conservative evangelical theology is belief that the constructive task of theology is never finished because theology is always only human reflection on the gospel within a particular cultural context. In other words, post-conservatives are critical realists. The gospel itself is one thing, and its expressions and elaborations are something else. The gospel is the first order language of faith expressed in doxology and witness. Theology is second order language of faith that seeks to expound on the gospel's meaning. Theology is always man-made. It is not delivered from heaven by oracles. and is therefore always open to revision and reconstruction. There is always more light to break forth from God's word through fresh and faithful research and reflection. To a very great extent, conservative evangelicalism closes the door on such new, fresh theological construction. A sign on Interstate 35 between Austin, Texas and San Antonio, Texas, touts the delights of a tourist town where time has stopped. The invitation is to visit Green, Texas, which is G-R-O-E-N-E, -E, should be pronounced Gruna, but we in Texas have a way of changing pronunciations. The invitation is to Green, Texas, and it carries the motto, Gently Resisting Change Since 1872. <laughs> Coincidentally, that was the year of the publication of Hodge's first volume of Systematic Theology. Post-conservative evangelicals believe the establishment of conservative evangelicalism is too concerned with resisting change, and not always gently. Change in theology is too often greeted with knee-jerk rejection before careful investigation and open-minded consideration. The controversy over open theism is a case in point. Although not all post-conservative evangelicals are excited about open theism, and some reject it, all regard the reaction to it by conservative evangelical leaders as overblown, if not hysterical. The same can be said of the controversies over postmodernity and inclusivism of salvation and others. The post-conservative mood is one of cautious openness to doctrinal revision, insofar as it is based thoroughly and competently on biblical research and reflection, which is what we see N.T. Wright doing with the doctrine of justification. Scriptural fidelity includes openness to correction of time-honored but erroneous beliefs in the light of God's word. In contrast, one habit of the conservative mind is to enshrine some past system of theology as the final word on doctrinal matters and shut the door firmly on correction and reconstruction. That is what some conservative evangelical scholars have done with what Gordon Conwell theologian David Wells calls the stout and persistent theology of Charles Hodge. A third hallmark of evangelical theology is to regard evangelicalism itself as a centered set category rather than as a bounded set category. A habit of the conservative evangelical mind is to locate and patrol the boundaries of authentic evangelicalism, which leads inevitably to testing the boundaries by occasionally pushing someone across them who has always been inside the evangelical movement. To the conservative evangelical mind, people and organizations are either solidly within or solidly outside the evangelical movement. Its boundaries are said to be clear and unchanging. One critic of post-conservative evangelicalism declared a center without a circumference is impossible and meaningless. That is, of course, simply not true. There are many centers without circumferences in the universe. Even in modern mathematics, one finds references to fuzzy sets and fuzzy systems of numbers which have no absolute boundaries. 
Fuller Theological Seminary anthropologist and missiologist Paul Hebert has well delineated the reality of centered sets in human societies and applied that to theology. Every movement is a fuzzy set. A movement, you see, is by definition boundaryless. What makes it a movement, as opposed to an organization, is a common center around which all parties gather. They are energized by a common force at the core of the movement and not corralled by a fence that keeps them in. The moment a movement gains boundaries, it becomes an organization. Organizations must have boundaries. Movements cannot have them. Evangelicalism is manifestly a movement and not an organization. It includes organizations, but it's not one itself. In order to have boundaries, it would have to have some means of granting membership and expelling people. Some conservative evangelicals talk about the movement as if it had a Vatican and a Pope, but it has neither, and no person or group speaks for all evangelicals. Post-conservatives embrace this ambiguous situation. They want boundaries for the organizations to which they belong, but they value and want to preserve the movement character of evangelicalism as a whole. For them, it is sufficient to have a strong magnetic center, which is the gospel of Jesus Christ, and they see no need for walls, fences, or boundaries. That means it is impossible to say whether a particular person is absolutely, unequivocally evangelical or not. Evangelical identity admits of degrees and is determined by relation to the center rather than location inside of or outside of boundaries. A fourth hallmark of post-conservative evangelicalism is belief that conventional evangelical theology has been too influenced by modernity and enlightenment modes of thinking. Post-conservatives fear that in spite of its loud criticisms of modernity, evangelical theology has subtly but notably succumbed to its own evangelical enlightenment. It has been shaped by that against which it so vehemently protests. Post-conservatives are interested in post-modernity as a new cultural context for theological reflection, but they resist tying the Christian theological star to any cultural zeitgeist. The evangelical enlightenment and inadvertent captivity to modern modes of thought, such as epistemological foundationalism, especially as manifested in Scottish common sense realism, has been helpfully exposed by Fuller Seminary professor Nancy Murphy in her book, Beyond Liberalism and Fundamentalism, How Modern and Postmodern Philosophy Set the Theological Agenda, published by Trinity Press International in 1996 as well, more recently, by Stanley J. Grins and John Franke in Beyond Foundationalism, Shaping Theology in a Postmodern Context, published by Westminster Press in 2001. These and other post-conservative scholars have offered an imminent critique of evangelical thought by showing that conservative evangelical theology has drunk too deeply at the wells of modernity. This is manifested in obsessive concern for rational certainty, through foundationalism and logical coherence, as well as insistence on truth as propositional in the sense that revelation must be reducible to statements of fact that demonstrably correspond to states of reality. British conservative evangelical philosopher and theologian Paul Helm argued for just such a strictly propositional understanding of revelation in his 1982 book, The Divine Revelation. Other conservative evangelicals either agree or write about theology as if they agreed with Helm. Evangelical faith undoubtedly does depend on ontological realism. That is, that there really is a stable reality out there to be known. Post-conservatives do not deny that even though their preference is for critical realism over uncritical or common sense realism. In other words, we post-conservatives recognize a gap between perception and interpretation on the one hand and reality itself on the other, especially in ultimate matters. Strict correspondence between the knower and the known in theology is both theologically dubious because it calls into question the transcendence of God and epistemologically and metaphysically corrupt 
after Kant's discovery of the activity of the mind in the knowing event. Against extreme forms of postmodernity, postconservatives argue for a stable, if dynamic, reality outside the mind. But against naive forms of realism, they argue for a non-identity of reality and interpretation. An element of perspective always intrudes in the interpreting and knowing process. And there are no indubitable foundations, but always only networks or webs of signals of reality. Knowing theologically is more like perceiving a pattern in a mosaic than following the printed instructions for assembling a new bicycle from a box. Furthermore, truth transcends propositions and rational coherence. Coherence can serve helpfully as a negative test of truth. Post-conservatives are not interested in tossing logic aside. But especially spiritual truth cannot be captured in factual statements and assertions. As Count Zinzendorf, the early pietist leader, leader of the Moravians, said, the moment one attempts to put Christianity into a system, one kills it. Or rather, one might prefer to put it in terms of Alfred Lord Tennyson's perhaps less stringent critique of theological systems in his poetic prayer. Our little systems have their day. They have their day and cease to be. They are but broken lights of thee, and thou, O God, art more than they. A fifth hallmark of post-conservative evangelicalism is concerned to include unfamiliar voices in the theological conversation. Theology is, after all, a conversation and not a monologue. Theology is reflection on revelation in the light of culture, using tradition and reason as guides. One must not confuse theology with doctrine, which so often happens. Here, at least, theology is understood as the process of examining doctrines and reconstructing them. Doctrine, you see, is the product. Theology is the process. For far too long, that process has been directed among evangelicals almost solely by white middle-class males. To a very great extent, it has been conducted along the lines of Reformed thought, with other traditions being excluded or marginalized. One conservative evangelical of the Reformed tradition, named Michael Horton, even went so far as to identify evangelical theology with the magisterial Reformed and Lutheran traditions, by saying it necessarily includes belief in total depravity and unconditional election. In any case, Reformed orthodoxy has served as a kind of informal magisterium for conservative evangelical theology. Whatever spoke with a different accent was viewed with suspicion <clears throat> excuse me, and usually ignored. All one has to do to test this concern for validity is scan the shelves of evangelical bookstores' theology sections or the pages of evangelical publishers' catalogs of academic and scholarly theology. How many books or articles in evangelical publications are by women or people of color? Look at the ranks of executive committees of evangelical theological professional societies. How many women and people of color populate them? Post-conservatives fear that conservative evangelical theology may be captive to a certain mentality highly valued by white, middle-class, educated North Americans, who are also male but not of particular resonance with women and people of color. Research into women's ways of knowing and into the influence of social and economic location on research should warn evangelicals to examine their theologies for biases based on vested interests of males, dominant ethnic groups, and economic classes. Post-conservatives are not afraid of the sociology of knowledge or hermeneutic of suspicion so long as these do not force theology into relativism. Rather, they can be useful tools for broad progress away from oppressive habits of mind toward a more inclusive theological community and conversation that reflects the richness of the kingdom of God. In particular, post-conservatives want to hear what women have to say and see what happens in theological formation when people of color bring their perspectives to bear. This takes effort, including a kind of kenosis or self-emptying for white males who are used to dominating theology. They fear it as a risk, and they're not sure what will happen. That reveals a kind of obsession with predictability and security 
Whereas the kingdom of God is risk and venture for the sake of inclusion of all who name the name of Jesus as Savior and Lord, regardless of ethnicity or gender. Post-conservative evangelicals do not hold some magic key that will unlock the door to greater diversity and inclusion in evangelical theological ranks, but they hold out the hope for such diversity and listen carefully to the voices of the marginalized, even when they speak with different accents that sometimes challenge time-honored presuppositions and conclusions. Post-conservative evangelicals are critically open to liberation theology and feminist theology and seek out dialogue with their representatives. They regard these theologies of protest as legitimate corrections to past patterns of exclusion and oppression. They are intrigued by Ellen Storkey's work, including What's Right with Feminism, published by Erdman's in 1986, J. D. Otis Roberts' Black Theology Today, published by Edwin Mellon Press in 1983, Justo Gonzalez's Manana, Christian Theology from a Hispanic Perspective, published by Abingdon in 1990. Fuller Theological Seminary Dean William Dearness evidenced this openness to diverse cultural voices by editing Emerging Voices in Global Christian Theology, published by Zondervan in 1994. Post-conservative evangelicals are determined to listen to diverse voices in the theological conversation, even as they refuse to accept whatever is said in that conversation without careful examination in the light of God's Word. <coughs> but they recognize that their own examination of God's word will inevitably be colored by gender, ethnicity, and culture. The Holy Spirit must be trusted to break us out of deeply ingrained patterns of interpretation that protect our vested interests of power and help us divest ourselves of domination for the sake of greater richness and diversity within the visible kingdom, including our theological project. Finally, a sixth hallmark of post-conservative evangelicalism is a determination not to settle down comfortably at any place along the path of theological discovery, but to remain pilgrims always only on the way toward the kingdom. Post-conservative evangelical theology is pilgrim theology. It is a mood of excitement for new discovery as opposed to one of suspicious defensiveness of past achievements. Another way of putting it is that post-conservatives believe in a theology of exploration and not a theology of museums. Museums are valuable. They enrich culture by preserving the past. But they should not become mausoleums of truth, which is what happens unless people venture out to chart new paths and explore new territories. Pilgrim theology is theology always on the move, reconsidering old doctrinal formulations and constructing new ones in faithful obedience to the gospel under the authority of scripture. It is theology without certainty, driven by blessed assurance that God is the author of faith and confidence in him who calls us to an ever greater grasp of his message. One of the earliest expressions of the post-conservative mood was not a theologian, but an English professor, Daniel Taylor of Bethel College, whose little book, The Myth of Certainty, the Reflective Christian and the Risk of Commitment was published by Word in 1986. There, Daniel Taylor delineates the venture of Christian reflection as a journey involving risk. The same theme was well expressed later by Leslie Newbigin in Proper Confidence, Faith, Doubt, and Certainty in Christian Discipleship, published by Erdman's in 1995. None of this means, however, that post-conservative evangelical theology engages in unfettered theological experimentation. Just like pilgrims on a journey to a shrine or a holy site, post-conservative theologians know where they have come from and have a vision of where they are going. They journey by maps, but remaining always open to new landmarks and pathways along the route. They may even make a new path over rugged terrain that gets them to their destination more quickly and safely. But they are not wanderers without guidance or goal. They do not agree with those who say the journey is an end in itself. The kingdom is the goal, and the journey, though enjoyable, is not an end in itself. They are not like some liberals who celebrate questions and denigrate answers, but unlike some conservatives who settle comfortably, sometimes even defensively, defensively into fortresses of past doctrinal accomplishments, they venture forth because they are called out and led by God to move toward greater approximations of truth. Liberals find them cowardly, 
because they trust the map of Revelation and refuse to wander here and there merely to enjoy the trip. Conservatives find them too adventurous and risky because they journey on beyond the camp others have turned into a fortress. Clark Pinnock is the ideal post-conservative pilgrim theologian who is always ready to admit past mistakes and move on into new positions as required by new reflection on God's word. Conservatives sometimes mock him as a moving target, but post-conservatives applaud his courage to change and admit that he had been wrong in the past. Without doubt, some evangelicals, especially conservatives, will cast aspersions at post-conservatives and their moves. It was the same between neo-evangelicals and fundamentalists in the 1940s and 1950s. The latter, the fundamentalists, accused the neo-evangelicals, including Carl Henry, E.J. Carnell, and Harold John Ockengay, of throwing all caution to the wind as they shook off the hyper-orthodoxy and separationism of their former comrades, the fundamentalists. That didn't stop them from taking the risks of new endeavors in theology. Out of that arose the post-fundamentalist evangelical movement in which so many of us were raised and to which we are profoundly indebted. But a few of those hardy theological adventurers dared to move further along the path, while others settled in at some point and even looked back longingly at the delights of their fundamentalist Egypt. While the latter missed the fierce clarity and sharp certainty of the country they left behind, Others, such as Bernard Ram, never looked back, but kept moving, even when it meant making adjustments to long-standing evangelical beliefs. In his case, they were young earth creationism and biblical inerrancy. Ram was always guided by the lodestar of God's word while keeping an eye on tradition, reason, and culture. His criticism of evangelical obscurantism stung some of his evangelical colleagues but he insisted that evangelicals engage in no special pleading, but accommodate theology to the brute facts of biblical research and of science. On the other hand, Ram was no easy accommodationist, allowing culture to subvert the gospel. In his last two books, Offense to Reason and An Evangelical Christology, Ram reiterated unequivocally his commitments to biblical authority and to the great tradition of Christian teaching. Ram became a mentor to post-conservative evangelical theologians who moved further along the path he trod away from fundamentalism, but within a broadly Catholic vision of the Christian faith. They share his appreciation for the early church fathers and for the great reformers, while drawing also on the radical reformers, pietists, revivalists such as Wesley, and modern movements such as liberation theology and the theologies of hope and history. Ram was a pioneer, but not a guru. Younger evangelical scholars such as Clark Pinnock and Stanley Grenz picked up where Ram left off. Today, Kevin Van Hooser, Rodney Clapp, John Frankie, Jonathan Wilson, and many other risk-taking evangelicals are carrying the torch dropped by Ram. Post-conservative theology is a risk-taking theology. Pilgrimage is always a risk. But the only alternative is to reduce the task of theology to reiteration and perhaps repristination of traditional beliefs. Along with that often comes the temptation to attack anyone who dares to think creatively in innovative ways about God. That is perhaps the most distressing mark of today's conservative evangelical community. Its leaders seem content to cast stones at their evangelical comrades who dare to engage in the constructive task of theology. Fundamentalism rears its ugly head in the growing habit among conservative evangelicals to award merit points for exposing heresy where no one had noticed it before. The result is a feeding frenzy of heresy hunting and a distinct lack of intellectual curiosity and vigor. Is the only alternative to that lazy relativism and a swamp of unfettered theological experimentation? I think not. Conservatives, post-conservatives respect tradition. We are not iconoclasts. Our recommended revisions are never made out of a desire for change for change's sake. We see value, however, in the continuing search for truth, and we hope to be convinced that no person, or we are convinced, I'm sorry, that no person has yet grasped all of it or imprisoned it in a system. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Olson, for that stimulating opening lecture.
we have a few minutes uh, to uh, give you an opportunity to raise any questions that you might have. So please, who will be first? Now comes the part that makes me the most nervous, but I enjoy the most. So please, feel free to ask anything. Yes, ma'am. Do you have suggestions on how to bring in those other voices that historically have not been yeah. heard in theological discussions and development? Well, there are voices already, and so we need to listen to them. And that takes some discovery. Many evangelicals, in my experience, are simply unfamiliar with what's out there. They've read secondary literature that that dismisses it as unworthy of serious attention. I think the best evangelical scholars uh, go out, find the original sources, the books, and read them, and bring them within their study and their research and even their classrooms. I know that one of the most eye-opening experiences for me was when I actually read Karl Barth, and he was nothing like I had been told. And so it, I think it's the same, and it was the same for me later, though not as big a surprise when I read feminist theology. Not that I agree with everything Rosemary Ruther says, or something like that. Um, but I've, I've met evangelical feminists, Elaine Storkey from England, and others who have themselves imbibed the best of feminist theology, brought it within an evangelical framework and said, listen, folks, there are some things we need to hear from the feminists. What's good about feminism is her book. So I think one thing is to find those voices already there in print or in person, bring them in, not be so afraid of them, not just read secondary sources about them, which are often distorted and wrong, but encounter them for ourselves and wrestle with them. And the other thing is to uh, let loose the voices that haven't spoken yet. And in order to do that, we're going to have to simply make room for them in our communities. And uh, I, together with Stan Grenz and Jonathan uh, Wilson and John Frankie, have uh, headed up a project the last few years called The Word Made Fresh, Renewing the Evangelical Spirit. And every year, in conjunction with the American Academy of Religion meeting, uh, which, which meets in a different city every year, we have a special session called The Word Made Fresh. And uh, what we insist on among ourselves, it's an unwritten rule among our executive committee, if we could be called that is, that it has to have women on the panel, it has to have people of color on the panel, it cannot be all white males on the panel, and if we can only come up with white males, we won't have the session. So I think that's what you have to do, and sometimes we have to reach out there to people that aren't very well known and say, would you come and be on our panel? You know, and then sometimes there's the accusation, well, you just put them on your panel because it, they're a woman. Well, so what? Let's do it, you know? So I think there are those two methods that we need to follow, and just getting rid of the fear of otherness is a big part of it. Yes, yeah, sure. I wonder if the trial also includes uh, people from uh, poverty, hmm. uh, people from other backgrounds that are not typical of uh, what? Yeah. And the list could be endless. Yes, we should. Uh, it gets a little bit difficult when you're in an academic setting because people are required, to, if they're going to make a presentation, to have some academic credentials of some kind. Um, but I have known of some attempts. You know, to bring in a, a homeless person to an academic setting. <laughs> That's hard, of course, because they look, you know, they feel like they're really on the spot. But in Waco, uh, we have a group there called Mission Waco that has done some of this and brought educated, affluent people together with homeless people and, and had a dialogue and so forth. And that's all to the good. I want to see that happening more and more. I didn't mention Asians. Um, Amos Young is a young evangelical theologian from Asia who is making his mark in evangelical theology. Some of what he's saying is raising eyebrows uh, in his Buddhist evangelical dialogue and so forth. Um, but that's the kind of thing we need to unleash and listen to. Ms. Tracy. My question is, um, is 
Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, <laughs> I've been involved in some of that. And sometimes it does end up in just butting heads. My first attempt at it was while I was a professor at Bethel College. And uh, there was a seminary, well, Bethel has a seminary. There was a United Church of Christ seminary about a mile away. And in Minnesota, some people refer to the United Church of Christ as Unitarians considering Christ. Um, that's probably unfair. There are evangelicals in the United Church of Christ, but it is one of the more liberal Protestant denominations. So we reached out to them. We found out that um, there had never been any relations, interactions, at least in anyone's memory, between Bethel Seminary and, and the United Seminary of the Twin Cities. And uh, I went over there, the first step was I went over there to hear Letty Russell speak. And uh, I was writing the book with Stan Grins on 20th century theology. And I was writing the chapter on feminist theology. We agreed long ago not to tell who wrote what chapters, and I just violated that, this, that agreement. But you can't tell Stan now anyway. So, um, But I wrote the chapter on feminist theology, and I thought that it was important for me not just to read their books, but to go hear them speak and try to interact with them as much as possible. So I went over there to hear Letty Russell speak, and it was a really eye-opening and spirit-opening experience for me. I didn't agree with everything she was saying, certainly. Um, and it was more than an academic experience. Um, it was a, a spirited cheer, section, cheer session for feminist theology. I was the only man in the room of about two or 300 people. In fact, one woman sitting next to me, I must have been a little nervous. She reached over and patted me on the knee and said, don't worry, honey, we're not going to hurt you. <laughs> and it was a foot stomping, hand clapping, cheer session. It was great. I really enjoyed it. Um, but So I went over there first, and then we invited professors from there to come over to Bethel, and we just sat and tried to talk to each other. I think it ended up in failure if our goal was to come to some great agreement, but that probably wasn't the goal in the first place. It was just to talk to each other. And then they reciprocated by having some of us over. It ended up with a class on both campuses that centered around liberal evangelical dialogue. Out of that, I wrote an article that was published in Ecclesia, Pro Ecclesia magazine on evangelicals and liberals in dialogue with each other. And I subtitled it, Whales and Elephants, Both God's Creatures, But Can They Ever Meet Each Other? Um, we're very different. True evangelicals and true liberals are very different. But I have found some of the best theological experiences have been my involvement in a group called the American Theological Society, which is mostly liberals. Meets in Chicago every year, twice a year. Some evangelicals go too, but it's been an enriching experience for me and I hope for them as well. And one thing we've discovered by just talking to each other is that our, our disagreements are often based on, um, or let's say our aversions to each other are often based on misconceptions. Their misconception of evangelicals is that we are all pretty much ignorant and uh, don't know very much about science, philosophy, culture, and so forth. We're just stuck in the past and so forth. And our misconception of them or our preconception of them is that they're out to destroy the faith, that they're not really sincere Christians. So we get over some of those things that are in the way of having true dialogue and just sit down and talk with each other. There have been two great books of dialogue that I'd recommend. One is Theological Crossfire by Clark Pinnock and Delwyn Brown. And Clark Pinnock is the evangelical representative and Delwyn Brown is the liberal representative. And the other one is uh, David Edwards and John Stott, two British theologians, an evangelical and a liberal. They both end up with the dialogue partners saying, well, we really do have some serious disagreements but we've come to respect each other. And that's all to the good. How can that be bad or wrong? So I think we just have to talk to each other and, and listen to each other. I found that I don't really understand another person's position just by reading their books or articles. It all changes when I meet them. And we talk to each other face to face. And we watch each other's body language and get a feel for each other's unwritten, maybe even unspoken signals. That's what we need more of.
Yes, in the back, Danny. Uh, you mentioned Kenneth and Van Hoosen and others, um, but those people aren't exactly well read as far as lay people, and, but you did mention Brian McLaren. I'm wondering, what do you see his role as in the role of post-conservative theology as yeah. a member of the church? I don't mean this as a put-down, but he's a popularizer, and I think he'd agree with me. He's not trained as a theologian, he's a pastor, but he has a good way of taking this kind of post-conservative evangelical theology, which he kind of discovered on his own, with, with some help perhaps, but he's not a trained theologian, and communicating it to lay people and other pastors through his books. What you get there in his books is really a distillation of much of what I've been talking about, often in the form of questions and, and dialogue between imaginary characters. He makes some mistakes here and there, and he knows it. I mean, he's willing to admit that. He's not a trained theologian, but that's fine. But that's what he is. He's a popularizer who takes post-conservative evangelical theology and communicates it to the masses. We have time for one more question, and then we have some refreshments in, in the lobby. One more question or comment? Well, they're ready for refreshments. <laughs> I'm happy to take another question. Okay. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Thank you.